cloud. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closer Show. As always, I'm Scott Carson, your host, and I am jacked up today to have a uh, a legend with us today on the show, I like to say. A woman who knows her business inside and out, who has done a tremendous job, uh, not only in her own real estate business, but helping thousands of other people as well to really take advantage of the market, do some big things, and literally change their Change their destiny, I want to say. So, good morning, Kathy. We're so excited to have you here. And, uh, hey, thanks for joining us early from uh, <laughs> Southern California, huh? Good morning. Yeah, it's not that early. It's nine. So, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. And uh, I know you've been a bit of a, a, a travel bug or you love travel just like I have much. And you were just out in Vegas at Julian oh. Zagati's Crowd Convert. Great event, as always, I'm sure. Oh, man, we had so much fun. I, I never used to love Vegas, but man, when you jump, when you step off the stratosphere uh, and fall 855 feet, then you, you see Vegas in a whole new way. Mm -hmm. Now, did you do that with the fluorescent <laughs> balloons tied around your face? <laughs> Oh, no. That was directly afterwards at the Blue Man uh, group, which is weird, but really fun. I think the guy came over and threw some cheese at Rich and then Rich, I, I don't know, like, no, Rich threw it at him and then he came back and spit it out in Rich's hand. So again, weird show, very fun. <laughs> like I said, I have a whole new uh, vision of Vegas. Yeah, we, I've seen Blue Man group a couple times and it's always yeah. a good time, especially when it's in Vegas. They take, yeah. they take the show up a little bit more of a notch than other places, but yeah. um, absolutely love Vegas. Used to spend about a month out of every Oct every October. I almost lived in Vegas for about six years straight with everything. So I know what uh, you're talking about. Never drink alone, but always have a lot of fun when you're there when you can, right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that don't know who Kathy is, which is a rarity out there, she's a CEO and founder of Real Wealth Network and the host of The Real Wealth Show. Uh, she's an active real estate investor, licensed real estate agent, certified coach, and, and former mortgage broker. That's why I love you and I have that in common. Uh, she specializes in helping people build multi-million dollar real estate portfolios through creative financing and planning. She was recognized as one of Goldman Sachs' 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs two years in a row, which is phenomenal, <laughs> and is frequently featured on such media as CNN, Fox News, CNBC, NPR, CBS Market Watch, and the Wall Street Journal. So, wow, quite a resume, Kathy. <laughs> Quite a resume, Kathy. Definitely. Thank you. But let's let's talk. What's what's your bread and butter when it comes to real estate? What do you absolutely love uh, about that aspect of of investing, whatever it is? And we'll go from there. How's that sound? You know, we have. Uh, I have this thing for wanting to know what's next, what's coming, get, kind of get there before everybody else. It could be that I was born and raised in uh, Menlo Park, which was, you know, I, I, I hung out at the same coffee shops as Steve Jobs, you know, so I was right there amid all that uh, tech growth. And I just love being in front of the curve. And, and so when I discovered, you know, this wonderful world of real estate that I didn't know anything about, except my mom and dad would buy a house, live in, live in it and make a million bucks, you know? And, and so I, I saw it as a way to um, make equity and become a millionaire. He was a dentist and one might think that's how he, he would make money, but it was through accidental real estate in, the, in California. Um, so that was my only impression of it. But uh, once I started to learn all the different ways that wealth could be built, mostly because I was a mortgage broker and could see the power of leverage at the time, uh, that's, that's what got me hooked. So what I was so lucky, I was so fortunate to have a podcast or have a radio show in San Francisco that my husband turned into this thing called a podcast that no one had heard about the day that it came out on, on iTunes. He's like, oh, let's just put your show on, on this thing. And and, uh, and overnight I had listeners worldwide. It was cause we were like the first, like one of the first and only podcasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so because of that, I got to interview really experienced people, people with far more experience than me. I was just new. I didn't know very much about real estate, but I got to learn from, uh, you know, these giants and, and one of them being Kiyosaki who taught me that 
uh, California was in a bubble, what to look for, how to know, and that Texas was not at the time. It was 2004, and it was a, a, whatever you call the opposite of a bubble, an under bubble. Um, it, it, it was 26% undervalued there. Mm -hmm. And so he showed me that if you could sell at the peak in California and buy at the trough in Texas, where everybody thought it was the craziest thing in the world to buy in Texas, nothing happens in Texas. But we followed him. He knew what he was doing. And, uh, and we're ahead of the curve there. And a lot of people, a lot of my listeners followed that advice as well, sold at the peak. We helped them buy in Texas. They never felt a recession. They didn't know there was one because we didn't feel it. That's a, that's a great, great point there. Yeah, we're pretty blessed here in, in Texas that we haven't, we didn't have such a huge appreciation. We kind of stayed lay, level at five, you know, 10% yeah. on an basis, even through the worst times. And it's still, I mean, Austin in itself here is a little bit of different. Uh, mm -hmm. I, we call it kind of California East. <laughs> yeah, because it's weird. <laughs> it <is> weird. <laughs> <laughs> I love Austin. Uh, Austin's a great place. And we, but I like to call it California because there's so many people doing the same thing. They're cashing out of their California properties, mm -hmm. moving air, buying a three times the size of the house they had in California, but putting you know, millions of dollars into their yeah. you know, bank deposit and savings and being able to use the leverage that smartly. So what are some yeah. of the key factors that you do that you're looking at now? in different markets out there to help you identify the next Austin or the next, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whatever next market out there. Well, you know, fast forward 10 years and well more now 13 or 14. Oh my gosh. Uh, that, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of the same things that California is again, back past its last peak and Dallas has gone up. A lot of Texas values have gone up. Uh, so yeah, what, where's that next place where you can sell your high-priced California property or, or Dallas property or Denver or Seattle, any, anywhere right. where it's kind of bubblicious and, uh, and go and uh, get really good cash flow. So all along, we've kind of looked for these places that have a, a bad reputation, so to speak, that people are afraid of them because they don't know what's happening right now. They just know what used to be. And I mean, an example, I, I will fill up a room now. Uh, we had uh, over 300 people at our last event. And I said, how many of you have been to, you know, Pittsburgh? One or two hands went up. And, you know, I said, well, what do you think Pittsburgh looks like? And they're like, oh, dirty. It's a dirty city. You know, all this steel. And it's like, well, you know, they haven't really been doing the steel thing for a while. In fact, people don't know that Pittsburgh is one of the cleanest, greenest cities now. It has like the biggest LEED certified building there and they're, they're leading the way on LEED. So um, you wouldn't know that. And, and, you know, when I'm in LA and I say, hey, did you happen to know that Pittsburgh is second to LA in film production? And, uh, you know, and that may be changing now to Atlanta, but there's a lot of film production there. So, the, you know, no, they don't know that. Did you know that Google's East Coast headquarters are there? No. So, you know, these are the things we want to know this stuff before anybody else so we can buy all the good deals first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree with you on that. It's good to know. And, and yeah. I totally, totally agree to that. There's, there's all these second tiered cities, I guess you could say, versus mm -hmm. the big ones that everybody thinks about. Yeah. You know, Top, in the, the lower part of the top 50 that are really great investment cities have a lot of regentrification going on where industry has changed there in the last 10, 15, yeah. 20 years. And, and, and definitely those upper, you know, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia cities are, are great examples of that. Now, you yeah. talk in your book, and I loved your book. All right. I Thank bought you. a copy of it. It's and, very simple. You can read it in, a, in an afternoon. I, I read it, read it sat, Saturday afternoon. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I love it because you, you really spell it out. Keep it really simple for people to get rocking and rolling on, on things. And yeah. I want you, can you, would you mind sharing a little bit of how important it is to have a, a real valuable why? And mm. in your first chapter, mm. you really align it. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you need a why for everything. Uh, I mean, just an example is our, our my wedding with my, you know, with Rich, we had to pay for it ourselves. So it's like, you had to come down to what, What's the most important thing we want from this wedding? You know, do we want people to have the best food in the world or the best wine or just the most fun? And we decided the most fun was the cheapest. And so we just went with that and we got two buck chuck and we had a great time. Uh, so you got to know your why. And, uh, and once you have that, everything else falls in line because the why is usually not very expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the piece people are, are missing is they think that money is going to bring them happiness when it's really the things that don't cost a time that bring you happiness. Um, although having money can bring you more of 
more, more fun. And, uh, you know, but when Rich and I had no money, we would go camping with the family at free campsites and have so much fun. The kids probably liked those trips more than Hawaii and Europe, honestly, because, you know, back when we had no money, we still had a good time. So anyway, your, your why, in, in our case, um, back in 20, uh, 2003, Rich was told he had uh, melanoma. He had been a, a bodybuilder and he would fry his red head and his white skin, his freckled skin, he would fry it to a crisp like he was Italian or something. And, and, uh, and he actually would get very tan. Um, and I remember saying, you know, that's probably carcinogenic, you know, but I didn't know him back then. He's like, oh, no, 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 there's no, there's no research on that. And I'm like, well, you're going to be the research. So um, sure enough, 20 years later, he had melanoma and uh, cut it out. But they, they, the doctor said, it looks like it spread. And you, if it did, you have six months to live. And um, there's a big why there, like, oh boy, okay, listen, you stay home with the kids, you do whatever you want, I will take over the finances, and I'll figure it out, even though I had been a stay-at-home mom, uh, two little kids, I had been, I still had my radio show, but really wasn't making any money on it. And so the why was, how can I make money and still be a mom? Because I could not, I could not just stick my kids in daycare and leave them all day. I just... I would rather live in a car and, you know, we'd probably be happier living in a car and not, you know, not having any money than me working and ne never seeing my family. Right. So I just, uh, I just thought there's gotta be a way. And so I had this radio show and I just started interviewing people with that question, you know, how do you make passive income? How did you do it? And I would only interview people who didn't have any money and suddenly had a lifestyle where money flowed in. And of course, you know, where I'm getting at it over and over again, it came to two things. One was business, having a, a self-managed business with, with people that, you know, that excellent employees that can make the business run on its own. That was one way to have passive income. And the other was real estate, which can be even more passive because you don't necessarily need that much staff, right? If you've got an apartment or a, a you know, you need the good property managers, but it's not, it may be as time intensive as running a business, although it is a business, right? So, mm. so, so that's what we did. We jumped in. We, we went for it. And the good news is that Rich is fine and the doctor was wrong. <laughs> yeah. And he's healthy. He's healthy as ever. He gets checked every year, uh, but he's good. Yeah, and you guys have a lot of fun. It's, it's definitely fun yeah. to see you guys on when you're traveling or speaking and doing whatever fun stuff. We were talking about that beforehand. We're glad social media wasn't around when we were in college, you know, because there'd be – I know I, my mom and dad be like, what the hell are you doing, son? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying. It is terrifying. I, I almost wish I didn't have a sneaky portal into my kids' uh, Snapchat and <laughs> Instagram, but I do. And yeah. I know what they're doing. And I, <laughs> so, hard. What, no, no <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. We could go so many different, different directions <laughs> in student housing, definitely. But anyway, yeah. Uh, you just came from the crowd converge with Jillian Sadati, and you, did, you, yep. you had a session on raising capital and the mistakes that you made early on. Now, mm. we, we had our, our webinar we usually do every Monday night, talk about raising capital in 2018, some of the simple things that you can do. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the mistakes that you made early on okay. growing your real estate portfolio, growing your private investors, and, and, and how you kind of overcame those mistakes. Well, what I learned is, you know, the hard way is – how much responsibility you have when you're investing someone else's money. It's, 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 hard, it's hard enough when you're, um, you know, investing your own money. I mean, I made some decisions that I just was kind of forceful with, with, with Rich, like, ah, oh, now we got to do this. I mean, we did amazing in Dallas. Like we made a lot of money there and didn't feel the recession, but uh, I also kind of pushed us into uh, some other things like Boise, Idaho, which just kind of collapsed during the recession. And, and so we definitely felt it in other areas. And it's hard enough to kind of lose your own money, your own family money and, and deal with that and keep the relationship healthy. But, uh, but then when you've got like friends and family and, and uh, people that, you know, they, they're trusting you, uh, I took it a little too lightly in the beginning and mainly not, not intentionally by any means, but just, I wasn't experienced enough to, to 
and be managing it, other people's money and didn't know that I wasn't experienced enough. And so um, because of the podcast, because of the radio show, I kind of became internationally known and I had a, an Australian fly me out and uh, I was like, yeah, free trip to Australia. And I get there and there's a, a room full of a thousand investors and they want to know everything about the US. They knew it had collapsed. This was like 2009 and they just wanted U.S. property. And so uh, I was like a celebrity. Like they followed me into the bathroom kind of thing. <laughs> like, like, Please, <laughs> five minutes. But, uh, you know, so it, it was like so much celebrity so soon in my career. I, I just wasn't ready. And so, and then other sharks recognized that. Um, and, and I think you and I can both agree that this is an, a shark infested field. Uh, real estate and investing in general. There are people who don't give a crap about you or your money. They only care about themselves. And I see it every day. It's amazing. And usually I could recognize the sharks. They, they would come to our investment groups and be like, hey, you know, can I offload some properties to your investors? <laughs> I'm like, can you define offload? Like you want to give them your problem? You know, so, you know, there are definitely people out there who don't care. Um, in this case, this guy that I ended up partnering with wasn't a shark per se. He also just wasn't as experienced and I didn't know. Um, and the world was falling apart. So basically he got this subdivision in Oakland, in the Oakland Hills that was, uh, had you know, nine homes overlooking the, the Bay, the Bay Bridge, beautiful, best school districts, very, very classy area, uh, very expensive. And these were million dollar homes that that went to, in default because the developer couldn't finish it because their credit lines dried up. They couldn't finish their projects. Uh, Indie Mac foreclosed. And, and so we came along and we could buy these million dollar homes for like $350,000 and like, yeah, how can you lose? And they had, didn't have their, their uh, COs yet. So, you know, we hadn't, what I didn't know is the guy who brought me the project and wanted to partner was a flipper. So he was used to flipping houses that already, that, that weren't brand new. But what he didn't know, and I didn't know he didn't know, was that uh, the, he had never bought a foreclosed subdivision, you know, and that there's a whole different process there because now you're dealing with the permits. That it's never had its approvals. And even though it was literally done, all we had to do was finish out the interiors. When we took this on, uh, the city of Oakland, did a 180. First, they were like, yeah, let's get it done. As soon as we closed, they're like, wait, how do you know that those piers and those foundations were done properly? We're like, I don't know. We just bought it from the bank. Like, yeah. And, and like, wait, would, wouldn't you have that in your books? You know, city of Oakland? I mean, you approved all this. Nope. They didn't have it. They lost everything. And IndyMac didn't have it. So how do I prove? How do I prove? And they're like, well, you're going to have to dig down dig down and prove that the, what? And so it turns out it would be like a million bucks to prove that the stuff was done correctly. And in the process of doing that, it would have compromised the integrity of the foundations. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, this is dumb. And so it took me six months, but we found the original developer working in a restaurant in San Jose. I don't know how we found him, but we did. And we're like, do you have those documents? And he's like, I do. <gasps> here's a check for $10,000, please give them to me. And he did, and we could move forward. But that six month period of the city just, just putting all this pressure on us, was it during a time when then they changed all the building code? Mm. And so they made us tear out perfectly good stairs and perfectly good anything because it was a 16th of an inch different than the current code. So it was a nightmare. And and so could have that have been avoided? I don't know. I, I think yes, because I would have only worked with someone who had done subdivisions before. And that's what I know now. Because we had almost an identical project in Portland with a 40-year veteran de developer. And we got right through it. And investors made 25% IRR. Nice. So what I did wrong was in, at that time, I didn't know uh, the whole process of raising money. So I literally, this will make you cringe. I literally sent out an email and said, hey, uh, we can buy this subdivision for $3 million. Anyone want to participate? And we raised it in an hour. And, and that's when I was like, oh, wow, there's this. I didn't know I could do that. And I also didn't know that I needed a PPM and an operating agreement and a subscription agreement and all these things to file with the SEC and do it right. 
And so fortunately, the Portland one where everybody made money, nobody cared that, you know, the PPM came in a little late. On the Oakland one, it was like, oh boy, you know, there's been losses here. I realize I didn't file this correctly. It was my first project. I didn't know what I was doing. I can't pay you back your losses because I don't have that much money. You could sue me. You wouldn't get very far. I, I know we all went in this together and the city of Oakland made it impossible. But if you just don't sue me, I will find a way to make this better. I don't, I, you know, it wasn't even that I was afraid of getting sued. It's that I know that these people gave me their, you know, their hard earned money and I couldn't just allow this, um, these losses. So they stuck with me and let our company grow and let us get better and only work with the best. You know, now we only work with the best developers who have, like I said, 40 years experience and they know what they're doing. And, um, and so recently in the fall, literally just in December, we got a deal in Texas. Can't tell you about it yet. It's unbelievable. It is incredible. And there's enough back end profit that these investors will, will be made whole. So, that's awesome. That I'm super stoked. <clears throat> that's a great story, but that's, it's a very valuable lesson of a lot of people did two things. One, you didn't let that stop you from doing other deals. You mm -hmm. said, Hey, I know we messed up on this. You, you communicated that we thought we had a home run. Everybody would think it was a home run and you ran into unforeseen circumstances, but I didn't let you stop from going out and doing it over it and doing, making money in other projects, paying people back and not giving up. And I think that's the thing that frustrates me the most. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you being a coach as well, out there when you're talking with these investors is that the first little hiccup they get you know they get down on themselves <laughs> <laughs> and they don't I like that i need one of those on my desk at all times <laughs> you know what you're gonna email me your uh, mail address i'll send you one i got a couple extra sitting over here all right awesome <laughs> but what are the, what are the, some of the simple things that you're teaching people out there to help them overcome their obstacles and overcome the mind games that they play with themselves sometimes well, you know, that's, you know, I hear a lot of times I'll hear people say, oh, the worst thing you can do, like never lose money. And, uh, and, and that's like, you know, d never lose money. And I agree, who wants to lose money? But at the same time, have you ever met anyone successful who hasn't lost money? Anyone? Have you? Ne I mean, even Warren Buffett has lost money. Mm -hmm. So you got to get over that. And because that will keep you from make, taking chances. And, and, and if you look at it as like this thing that is, is only a one-way thing, then, you know, you freak out when you lose money. And I, I look at it more like it's a river. You know, it's, the, the money is there. It's flowing. You just have to understand how to ride that, wa you know, that wave or that, right? Like if, if you've ever been uh, river rafting, you know, the first time you river raft, you're going to probably flip over mm -hmm. unless you have an amazing guide with you to take you down. Um, and even then you might fall out, but then you get back in and you do it again. And the river's always there. So the money is there and, and you're going to lose it and you're going to make it and you're going to lose it and you're going to make it, but hopefully you're going to make more than you lose. Um, you know, and, and understand what, what's definitely going to lose like Bitcoin, you know, like, did you not see that coming? Uh, the stock market didn't, didn't uh, yesterday, that should have happened a, a while ago. You know, <laughs> like the, these stock market crashes. So understanding there are ways to lose less money, but you know, to get so attached um, to losses is, is what will make this a painful journey. Painful because you can recover and you can learn from losses so that you do better next time. It's the only way. I mean, it's like looking at these Olympic skaters and saying, oh, they never fell. If, if Rich and I go skiing and I didn't fall, he's like, why didn't you fall? You weren't trying hard enough. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're too much in your comfort zone there, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the uh, Winter Olympics commercial with Lindsay Vaughn talking about all the scars that she has on it. Yeah, ass. yeah. It's a great, a great example of that. You got to fall down and pick yourself back up. It's fall down nine times, pick yourself up ten times is the old samurai. I, I would never work with somebody who hasn't – had losses because I want to know, you know, would you want to get on a, on a flight with a, a pilot who's never had a challenge? <laughs> you know, I mean, like you want to see that guy has gray hair and has been through it. You don't want the guy who's just, you know, like <laughs> only been flying when it's perfect conditions. So, <laughs> I'll take Sully every time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, so, One of the things you, you uh, mentioned in the book is that your favorite uh, kind of uh, rental property that you like to focus on is kind of the hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range, mm -hmm. right? Explain why that is. 
or less if we can, if it makes sense. Um, yeah. Once you get over 150 or 200,000, your cash flows just sort of decline. And that's a real generous generalization, not, not true everywhere. But just what we found is that if you want the highest cash flow, if you're, you're, if you're in, in it for cash flow, you want to stay around under 150 and maybe even every now and then 200 might make sense depending on the area and the rents. But, you know, if you go in too cheap, then you're really dealing with a whole different kind of tenant and, and one that maybe doesn't have a, a steady job or is more transient um, or just, you know, there's more hardship there. So uh, we, we like to stay in around the eight to $1,200 rent range. And, um, and if, if we can get a house for $50,000 that rents for 900, then I'll take the $50,000 house. But in general, you know, prices have gone up. We do, do have some markets where that's still possible today for a limited time. Um, we love those markets, but you know, a lot of people, especially Californians, man, I have to like retrain the brain of the Californian. <laughs> it's amazing because they just don't even know that's possible. And they think you're crazy when you say such things, because you know, a, a $100,000, $200,000 property in California might exist, but it might not be an area you want to be anywhere near. <laughs> so, yeah, where's the doghouse? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think someone was renting the under part of their dinner table to someone? Did you did you see that? <laughs> it's all it's the Airbnb. It's table BNB. <laughs> they did. They like put a tablecloth and you could rent it in San Francisco. You know, maybe whatever. <laughs> you know, That's maybe there's something out of thin air. <laughs> maybe I should rent out the back of my car. I never thought of that. I just put a bed in there. <laughs> There you go. Hey, I got four spots in my car. Each of you can get a seat. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got pillows. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That that would be a whole new thing to Uber. (laughs) (laughs) But but I just, uh, and the other thing is that, you know, again, I learned that I was lucky because I had this radio show, The Real Wealth Show, and could interview brilliant people. I would, I hadn't been in the business long enough to know very much. And and so I had to learn from others, which is the gift we're giving others, right? Getting to... Mm -hmm interview these people with years of experience so that, you know, again, you can lose less money and make more money um, learning from other people's losses. But uh, so if there is a recession and let's face it, there's going to be one, there's one coming. We don't know when it could be this year. It could be in two years, it could be in three years, but there's one coming because they always do. It's the way it works. So if you want to ride that out, the areas that, that seem to coast through these are areas where, uh, it's it's kind of almost blue collar. Like those people maybe aren't affected by a stock market crash because they're not in the stock market. Uh, they just work for the, uh, you know, the factory nearby. And so, you know, there's just no effect. And, or if there is, like you said, it's a 5% or so, like, like in Texas. So, um, it, whereas in, in Malibu, uh, where I'm sitting right now, uh, there were houses right around here where their dip was from 10 million to 5 million. Like mm-hmm. they, $5 million loss. And obviously no one's doing that around here. Well, around here, they are investing in those. But um, but if, if you're in a $500,000 property or a million, people, people in California have million dollar rentals where they're getting 3000 a month. It's like retrain the brain. That is no, no, no bueno. Uh-uh. Well, that's a, that's the thing is uh, a lot of people in California will slice their grandmother's throat for a six cap. And it's just, it, it, we see that a lot of times with us buying the distressed debt side. We talk about, hey, we're picking the debt up at 25% of what the property's worth. It's worth us taking the time to go through either foreclose it or work a modification out to get it reperforming. And a lot of people don't realize that, like, well, I want to want to buy my million dollar house. I was like, great, I can buy half of Akron for a million bucks, you know, or in other areas that make sense for us to do that. So yeah, retrain the brain is is always a difficult thing sometimes. It's just a matter of kind of educating people and help kind of share what's going on. Did I lose you, Kathy? You're looking like you there. I don't know if we lost her or not. Hmm. Are you there, Kathy? There I you can, yeah, I can there hear you. All right. That was so, weird. That was weird. Yeah. Somebody Sorry. in San Francisco decided they wanted to run out their table and yeah. decided to pack it. <laughs> <laughs> but we see a lot of that. And it's, it's, it's just, I think the, the number one thing we always have to teach people about is is ROI. What's a re- real return on investment, but also a return on time or ROI mm-hmm. versus ROT, right? Mm-hmm. The most effective use of our time and our investments. But yeah. you are uh, you you do a great job of teaching people 
throughout California through your Willworth Network. And you've started, that's been going on for a little while. I know that we've got some people that are listening to the show that are starting their, their local meetup groups or local networking clubs, and they got four or five people. You've been doing the Real Worth Network for how long now? How long have you been going with that? Since 2000, yeah, three or four. We, it started where, uh, like, I, like I said, it was all, all of it was by accident. I didn't plan any of this. But uh, I, it was, all came from my desperation to understand passive income so that I could stay home with the kids in case the doctor was right. Um, and so I was, I was like interviewing everybody. And then because I got these celebrities on my show, pretty soon I kind of became a local celebrity in San Francisco and all these real estate groups would invite me to speak or MC their events. And I mean, I'm telling you, I was brand new in the business. I was no business telling anyone anything about real estate. I just wanted to interview the experts, but I would go to these these clubs and they would bill me as this, you know, real estate expert that I knew I wasn't. And, and then I would sit and listen to these speakers who were pushing for these boot camps and these, you know, 10,000 here and 20,000 here and hurry up. There's only five left and you get to the, and people run into the back of the room and I'm just watching it all going crazy. And, and one time this man was sitting next to me and he goes, he goes, that guy's lying. This is someone who's still on the circuit, by the way. Mm. And, and um, so this was 10 years ago. And, and he's like, I'm, I do foreclosures and he, everything he's telling is not true. Uh, and so he raises his hand and says, sir, you can't do that in California. And, and the speaker goes up, oh, let me just take a quick break. We're going to just have a break. And he escorts me and this guy out of the room. And that's when I thought, oh boy, you know, there's a lot of people teaching some, some crappy stuff and, and selling things that people don't need and that don't work. And I mean, there's a lot less of it now, thanks to the, the podcast and the information, free information out there that's readily mm -hmm. accessible or very affordable. But back then you didn't have very much. So the only way you knew how to do this was buying the boot camp. And so, and some are great, you know, some are very, very good. A lot of them weren't. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, I, I need to just start a group and just bring in, like, just like the radio show, just bring in people who are doing real estate and that no suits allowed, no business suits. I mean, you better have a baseball cap and a t-shirt because I want to see that you just came off the construction site, you know, and tell me what you did to become a millionaire. And, and uh, it just grew from that, nothing for sale, nothing for sale. And, um, and again, not, not that there's anything wrong with selling things. It just, uh, our audience was so over it because mm -hmm. they're Californians and they're targets because they have money and everybody was coming trying to sell them stuff. So we're like, we're not doing it. And, uh, and that just helped grow the group. So, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, this is what they asked at Crowd Converge is how have you come to a point where literally in, in December, this Texas deal that was phenomenal, we were able to raise $13 million, uh, $6 million in two days. And then the final then was like, oh, we need to, it's 13 now. And it, it was in like a couple of weeks. And so like, how did we get to that point? Well, there's a lot that it takes to get to that point. But the first and foremost is that you care about other people's money more than anything. And you care about like how or what, you know, you're going to get your, cut your 2% management fee, whether you're making. I'll come back. That's good. That's good stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> now, with you interviewing all the, the people that were doing big things, stuff like that, have you found that the successful people out there, that the people that are really doing the business are the most approachable, the most willing to give you a few, a few minutes of their time to help you avoid making mistakes? Uh, yes. And it, it's funny now to be that person, you know, that I, the, the kind of person I used to interview. Right. Um, it, we're also so busy, you know, especially if you're doing deals and I mean, we've got, I don't, I don't, I've lost count of our LLCs. I don't, I don't even know how many, I mean, we've got a lot going on and a lot of good deals. So time is limited. And I'll often have people say, can I just take you to lunch and, and learn from you? And it's like, you have no idea what I would give you during that hour is worth far more than lunch. And so I don't have time for that. But that's why, yes, people are willing to share, but just be 
cognizant that they're also busy. I, I personally think the best way to get in with someone who's highly experienced and in the game and, and doing stuff is to offer to work for free. And I know that sounds amazing I, and like not everybody can do that, but um, I had a guy come in and say, can I just work? I will just shadow you. I will get your coffee. I will take care. I'll go to, to the mail for you if you'll just let me sit in the office. I'm like, sure. And he did that for about six months, full time. He showed up in a business suit. I'm like, you don't have to wear a tie, dude. You know, like you're getting my coffee. But he's like, he, he did every day, all day. And so, yeah, of course we hired him after six months. <laughs> I'd be a horrible person if I didn't. <laughs> but, um, but, th- but like in that six months, he learned and he became indispensable. And so if you, you know, if you have the ability to do something like that, or just, you know, listen, there's, you know, listen to podcasts, but to, to try to get one-on-one, that's, you know, I, I imagine for you, that's like, you probably don't have a lot of time for that. No, we, uh, yeah. I actually, I stopped doing lunches with people a long time ago. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, the m- majority of what we do is so outside of Texas. I mean, we do get a few people that stop by the office and I'll give everybody, you know, 15, 30 minutes if they schedule on time, but mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we were, not only are we running this, but we were running a couple hundred note deals at any given time and, and moving some tapes and stuff like that. Very blessed to have a, an amazing staff and amazing vendors that do a lot of the heavy lifting for us so we can focus on, on the big rocks of raising capital and, and finding the next deal with people. But I agree with that. It's, it's nice. You know, Hey, I would love to go to lunch, but lunches never take 30 minutes or an hour. They're always an hour and a half, two yeah. hours. And I know that you value your time like I value my time and it's worth a whole lot more than what lunch would be even at Ruth Chris or somewhere nice. Yeah. And and that's not, you know, definitely not trying to be rude. Like we try to make ourselves as accessible as possible through webinars and podcasts and events and so forth. Um, But yeah, so there's so many ways to learn. Uh, But you know, so if if you've got a lot of people starting out, first of all, I want to say like, you are the guy they're listening to the right guy. I knew about you way back. And I think I was one of those people trying to get your time and you didn't have any time for me back then. So. <laughs> me? No, I always look at the note guys. Like you're, you're kind of the upper echelon of, of, of amazingness. Like notes are cool, but you, it's hard to start out in notes. It is. Yeah. Right. I mean, maybe it's not, maybe you teach how, but it seems like you need a little bit of money. And I just feel like it's kind of the savviest investing there is. Well, you know, you have a mortgage background. That's where I came from. I was a mortgage broker here. I got, I got fortunate enough to mentor up with a couple of people for like four years. I ran the mortgage business side, learned the note business you know, as they were off on the other side of the big office and, 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 and took as much in as I could during that four years and then went out in 2009, 2010. And the peak of it, which mm-hmm. was the wild west and hacked out the secondary market for myself and, and stuff like that. But yeah, notes are, are fun. They, but they, you do have to have a lot of knowledge of what's going on with the fix and flip side or short yeah. sale. Oh okay. yeah. It's, it's, but, but then once you do, I mean, you know, this partial note stuff and creative, I mean, man, it is, it is, like I said, if someone can learn it and get it, it is the upper echelon of investing with the brightest and savviest. And uh, I, I own notes. I just don't know how to do all that partial sell part of it and get, you it's know what? complicated. <laughs> partials, no offense, partials are the over the most overhyped part of the note business. Okay. Okay. So don't feel bad. <laughs> I've sold maybe five partials in my full years here, you know, since 2007. Yes, they're great and it makes it look nice on a calculator. Ooh, I yeah. can do all this stuff. <laughs> most of the time I'm buying the whole note and selling okay. the whole note off. I'm not doing partials. I it just Okay. I, I agree. Oh, it's so great. Look at the partials. Yeah. It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> at least, at least when I've, I've gone to Eddie's classes, I'm like, what? I want to do that. But we, but when, so the 13 million I raised in, uh, you know, in December, we structured it as a note because, you know, no, it's just one of the safest ways to invest. And, and, you know, when you, when you're at a low LTV and you understand the value of the property and, and, you know, potentially we could have uh, had the seller finance, uh, seller finance to us, but it was like, wait, then we have to take on all the ownership stuff. It's mm-hmm. like, Hey, how about we just go in as a note and then we just get paid mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, have the option to purchase this thing, which we are, but I knew that putting our investors into it as a note was, there was just no, 
hesitation. Right. It, you know, it's all going through title. It's recorded first position, low LTV, like where's the risk? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I'm sure there is, I don't want to say there's not risk. There's always risk, but it's less. I, I don't, what I don't understand is how someone can invest in something like Bitcoin or, or the stock market where there is no collateral, mm -hmm. uh, w when you can do something like a note where there is. So <laughs> I just don't, I don't get it. Yeah, the bank always gets paid one way or another, either getting paid or taking the property back for the most part. So I, I will totally agree to that. What cracks me up is all these Bitcoin experts that are, you know, they're not flipping properties, they're flipping flapjacks. And so now they're a Bitcoin <laughs> expert. There, there you go, flipping flapjacks and flipping properties. You go back and talk to the guy that you got the, uh, the foundation stuff from. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel so sad for people because it's the, it's the same thing that happens over and over again and greed sets in and it's like, oh my gosh, look at so-and-so made all this money. I'm going to mortgage my house and buy Bitcoin at 20000 and And I know people did that and it's so mm -hmm. sad. And it's the same with the stock market. Oh, you know, it's been going up and Trump is so fantastic that all his policies are going to keep it going. And no, no matter how good a policy is, if something's overpriced, it's overpriced, period. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, a, a new policy doesn't change that, you know? mm -hmm. especially when there's no collateral. So it's like, ah, oh, it makes me so sad because it's just history repeating itself over and over again. I'm going to finish my book on this topic. It's taken me two years because I put it down, forgot to pick it back up, but I'm going to finish it because I don't want to see people speculating like that ever again. I agree. I, it drives me bonkers when I see that stuff. I'm like, come on, people, think. Yeah. Think, 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 think. But <laughs> tell you what, when you finish that book, let me know. I'll have to have it bring you back on here and, and talk about it and help promote it for you as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, I know you got a busy day ahead of you. I don't want to take any more of your time. Kathy, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us here on the Note Closer Show. Uh, I need to get your address because I got something I'm shipping to you besides just the noisemaker. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. If anybody hears that on my show, you will know where it came from. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, tell, tell them about your podcast. You got the, uh, the show that you have been going for a while. Tell them about that. Yeah. The Real Well Show is still what it always has been, which is uh, me interviewing people on their creative ways, whether they just started out their first investment or they're doing really sophisticated stuff like you're doing. I just interview people and their, and their stories. And then um, a couple of years ago, I started Real Estate News uh, podcast, which is like a very short one news story a day that I, I'm, I'm told a lot of real estate agents and people in the industry listen to because the, it just keeps you on top of this ever-changing market and, and trends and all the you know, new tech companies. There's going to be massive, massive change coming in the next couple of years. And if you're not on top of it, you're going to be left behind. So we try to keep everybody up on, on what's going on. And then when they're making a deal, they sound real smart because then they, they say, oh, yeah, interest rates, we're all done, whatever. So they, they're <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> Good times, good times. Well, hey, Kathy, thank you so much for taking time in our busy schedule to join us here. I know that my uh, listeners appreciate it. Uh, as always, if we can do anything to help you out with, don't hesitate to reach out. We're always glad to help out and help promote anything we can for you. So thank you for being a, a true light in the dark path of real estate in some cases, I will tell you that. You know, you are, are definitely a, uh, an icon doing a great job out there educating people and just giving, giving, uh, giving back to people what you obviously took from the people you learned and just having a big heart and making things happen for people. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. No problem. I'll have to have you on my show too. <laughs> All right. Hey, sounds good. Awesome. <laughs> All right, everybody. <laughs> that will wrap it up for this episode of the Nut Closer Show. Thank you for listening. Once as always, uh, make sure to share this. If you enjoyed this, like if you're listening to this on Facebook live, if you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher and any other podcast, make sure to go ahead and leave us a nice review. Go out and check out Kathy's two different podcasts as well and her shows. And then also you can always check out the replays by going to weclosenotes.com and checking out the episodes on the blog. Otherwise, guys, go out, make something happen this Tuesday, and uh, we'll see you all at the top, everybody. Bye.